So our last conversation, that was mm. quite a thrill. Yeah, it sure yeah. was a, a <laughs> really fascinating how, how it really took off on the internet. But I think we, we, we talked about many, many subjects that people can relate to and they feel, but they had no words you know, to express it. And now they saw it and it was like, aha, for very many. Mm. Yeah, um, and you um, and uh, I, I, I must say that that you really uh, were one of the easiest interview subjects. Flattered to hear that. You really have so so much uh, so much uh, knowledge to share and so many great examples and and well thought through uh, through um, uh, ideas about mm. uh, about architecture and mm. uh, I uh, I definitely think that was one of the reasons why some of the TikTok clips mm -hmm. went really mm. viral with uh, yeah. over a million views and yeah. uh, and shares it was uh, it was really really fun to see yeah, yeah it, it was amazing I can, I can tell you it's really really this TikTok thing because people at work just random people at work that I've not talked to that have no general interest in architecture they came forward to me I saw you on TikTok like yeah. what? <laughs> so 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 it, it really really took off this TikTok, and some watched the whole interview, and I still get I got one like two days ago. I get you know mail from people that watched the entire interview, and they're really happy. They want to discuss you know this subject or that subject, but but really they all tell me that it was a real eye eye opener. So so I'm very very happy for it because it it. It has, I think it has helped a lot of people, of course it helped me as well, you know, because I, I created more interest for this subject, that you can do something, mm -hmm. that we shouldn't just be, you know, passive uh, spectators of, of our built environment we're in ruin. And now a lot of people, more people at least, have hope that we can change, that the future don't need to be some kind of dystopia, that it can be beautiful. Mm -hmm. Everyone can live in their Italian village. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, mm. in a few days you're going to Canada, is that right? Yeah, I'm going to Canada this Wednesday and having a talk on, uh, it's like uh, urban talks. They, I think they have like a yearly or, or every second year, like a forum where they have different speakers talking about or, uh, different urban subjects. Uh, and this year, and I think it's very much thanks to a former employee at, at the Onotva municipality, uh, I was invited. So I, together with another architect, will you know, present different perspectives of, of new traditional architecture. Mm. And because this, uh, I guess this, this conversation will be sent afterwards, I can spoil a little here. Mm -hmm. I will go as usual, I will go full frontal. It will not be a, just this regular polite uh, uh, lecture about how nice things are and we should do a little of that. It, it, we really need to go on attack mm. because uh, there's own, no other way. They own, still own all the institutions, they are losing the grip. Um, I saw a very, very encouraging uh, photo from, from Swedish television yesterday about how one of our you know, regular television channels showed uh, that like, there's like an ongoing paradigm shift in, in Swedish architecture. And it was not done by some kind of prudent traditional group. It was mainstream, you know, morning television program that showed this. So things are happening and things are moving. And, and I'm uh, happy to be the part of it. And, and I want to bring this, you know, to, to many other countries. And Canada really seemed to need it. You know, I, yeah. I, I only know Ottawa from Google Street Views. And it was not a pleasant sight. So. No. Mm. Mm. And it's also... I. I think it's so uh, so mm. important now when we see that yes things are happening the, mm. there is there is a movement uh, on on going towards mm. more classical architecture but uh, it's it's really just 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 the beginning oh, and, very very uh, much so. and uh, mm. I think that's it's it's easy to to forget that <clears throat> especially if you have been in in the um, if you've been uh, fighting for uh, classical architecture for a long time and you mm. suddenly see that people are interested mm. and you see one or two examples mm. in your local area that is mm. going in the positive direction, it's mm. easy to be like, oh, this is, this is it. Yeah. And in, in Norway, um, 
there has been, as you know, a, a, a mm. rise in the architectural up, uprising, which mm. is uh, fantastic. And they have gained thousands of mm. followers and they are uh, constantly being commented uh, on in the news. Mm. And But then there was this one example in Oslo mm. central city where it was supposed to be built a typical ugly modernistic mm. building. And mm. then it was changed out. The, mm. Modernist architects said, we're not building this, we're mm. building something that is close to classical, mm. that uh, is more traditional. And of course, that's fantastic. It's, mm. uh, it's really, really great. Mm. But then this one of these, <clears throat> I, I guess he's the main, uh, he's the main uh, architecture commenter in, uh, mm. in a Norwegian newspaper, a uh, very typical mainstream mm commentator he's always mm. he doesn't have like very strong mm. opinions he's mm. commenting and and he he wrote this uh, piece in the newspaper Morgenblade and said mm. well this is the last time I will ever write about architecture architecture uprising mm. because they have won and it was and <clears throat> I think that is uh, a very false embrace it's a very <laughs> false embrace mm. and it's uh, like so it. I don't know his intentions. Uh, I, I don't know the person, but it. Oh, I do. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. It. It. Uh, it uh, felt, uh, or it. Uh, it could easily be a way of uh, stopping the movement by saying, like, okay, this mm. is it. You've got what you wanted. Mm. This one building. It mm. is possible. Okay. Now stop. That's exactly what it is, because we have seen, you know, nothing is new in the universe. So we have seen it in Sweden, this, you know, false embracement. So one of our star architects, I hate the world, uh, Gert Wiengård, in the beginning, you know, he embraced architectural rebellion. He thought, you know, by embracing it, he would make it go away. Mm. And, and you give the people, let you know, some, some crumbs or something, then, then they will be happy. But we didn't go away. So then after a while he got angry and showed his true face. It just, you know, they think that if this, this is just a fading trend. So if we give them a little classical, then in five years we can continue business as usual. Mm. So it's, it's, how to say, confession under gallows. And you really need to keep the pressure. And everything has just really, really started off. It is an oil tanker. And the old tanker needs to make a complete U-turn and we have just one millimeter. Mm -hmm. So now we have planted you know, the, the mine seed in a lot of mines. Not all, not all the mines that we need to plant it, but it has been created. So we are allowing ourselves now to think that we can build classical. And next step is to actually build classical. So we have a lot of discussion now about projects and there has been one project now completed recently in Sweden. But as you mentioned, yeah, one, two projects in what? How many projects are completed each year in Norway or Sweden? Mm. Thousands, thousands. So it's still a really, a little bit of a drop in the bucket. And this is not like this is not a niche. This is the way how we should build mm. everything, everything: railway stations, uh, uh, department store, logistics centers, airports, uh, airports, factories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ev every yeah. single building, yeah. because it's not a style it's a framework and architecture philosophy how you should design a building it's a mindset mm. so with this mindset you can create every type of building modernism is a different mindset a mindset that is anti-human in all its ways it began with like pure rationalism this view that ma man is a machine and, and house is a machine for living and now it's just you know individual narcissism of an architect Make as many strange shapes as you can, so you get attention. Mm. So that's it. So why should we have allowed this ideology in our built environment for the sake of some kind of diversity? Oh, we need new ugly buildings and new strange buildings because we need some kind of diversity. No, we don't. We need a thousand different types of traditional styles. We need, you know, everyone is beautiful, but different, you know, because the framework is what you know creates the beauty so that everything will be beautiful in the end no matter what classical styles you will use or come up with when you build mm. and that's uh, uh, that's also an uh -huh. uh, an ideal situation where you mm. actually can discuss which one of 
all these yeah. new projects mm. that are most beautiful. Mm. Not just that it's one out of uh, a mm. thousand that is mm. uh, that is uh, closer to beautiful, yeah. but that you actually see someone that use more more uh, vernacular mm. architecture. Mm. One is uh, uh, Greek uh, mm. classical, more Roman mm. arch uh, classical, mm. and and then you can decide which ones. Uh, that are most beautiful and you can yeah. have a discussion about that that would mm. be the uh, an ideal an the, ideal the situation. same heated discussions that we had 100 years ago or 200 years ago mm. it, it's modernists often like to point out oh this or that building was very controversial when it was built mm. and there was a lot of arguments and we, yes and we have examples in every city you have in oslo you have we have in stockholm we have with the noble palace that was not built because it it looked too oriental in its in its art nouveau architecture, but in a sense things are relative because in that time they fought about different classical styles. Mm. Today we just settled with any classical style because the option modernism is you know so horrendous and so ugly. So uh, that is the final goal. What is, we come back that we fight which classical style should we build in because of course styles can also have political leanings. So maybe we want this thing to be more of national romanticism. No, I don't like national. Let make it more like yogurt like. There can be all kind of, of discussions, but no one will doubt that the building will be beautiful. Mm. It's uh, uh, yeah. So it will be a very re refreshing discussion. <laughs> I was uh, I was recently thinking mm, yeah. uh, uh, comparing it to. Um, uh, I'm not sure how to uh, mm. express it in English, but the uh, food making uh, chef uh, mm. competitions, mm. they still have international mm. uh, food making competitions mm. that mm. are so high prestige mm. with the best chefs in the world that comes mm. to compete. Mm. And uh, they have different ways of mm. cooking mm. and they make uh, different uh, dishes that are mm. from different kind of uh, mm. uh, countries and uh, uh, cultures but they are all built on an old craft that they have mm. learned from their mm. masters and none no one in the panel will doubt that the food tastes well no and none of them will doubt that they that the chef has really tried to make it taste well mm. uh, and then they have heated discussions mm. about which one tastes best Mm -hmm. And you can, just as you can have discussions about what kind of mm -hmm. red wine you like better. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, that was the kind of arguments, as you said, that they had uh, about architecture before, mm -hmm. because it was a kind of passion, it was a kind of taste, but it was in That it was beautiful same. was grand. Yes. <laughs> yeah. it was so, so, grand. so it's like, it's not that we have to discuss if it's yeah. beautiful or not. It's more like, what message do we want mm. to send with this building? Yeah. But it's beautiful, no, no doubt, no discussion, no, no doubt at all. It was taken for granted. Much like we're taking for granted, like a new building in, built in, in Sweden will have like a, uh, how to say, a, um, a kitchen appliances in mm. the kitchen. It's standard now and there will be a floor. It's not like if you buy an apartment in Spain, you get four concrete walls just. Mm. In Sweden, we expect certain things. Uh, and 100 years ago, they expected the building to be beautiful, no matter what style they built, because everything new building was beautiful, because all in a sense belonged to the classical tradition, the framework and the mindset. Different styles, but the same mindset and framework, how to, how to design the building how to divide the facade, what to think of, human scale, proportions, all these things that are a completely lost art today. Mm. And I, mm. um, I also think that it's, um, it's fascinating how this uh, topic of uh, beauty has mm. been taken for granted for so, mm. uh, in the past, in the mm. ancient mm. Greece and everything, it was uh, similar to Although it's it's a bit s simple uh, to compare it, but still it's it was regarded similar to tasting well mm. that the food should taste well. So mm. there were few philosophical uh, definitions of mm. beauty because it was like of course it's it's supposed to be beautiful, and mm. it can be beautiful in different ways, but it's not ugly, mm. and uh, uh, and. That leaves the situation that we are in now when suddenly modernis modernism has uh, disregarded beauty mm. as a valuable, 
as something valuable to strive for, mm. then suddenly we have this, in, in fact, exciting task of defining beauty. Because, mm. of course, there are philosophers that have tried to define it, mm. but it's, uh, it's not as well developed as many mm. other fields. And mm. um, um, uh, what, uh, do you have any views on what, uh, uh, how to define beauty? Yes, I do. I do. Yeah. It's not a complete definition, but, but part of it, and I mentioned it in the last interview as well, is readability. Mm. Readability combined with, I talk about everything that you see, you know, with eyes. Readability combined with some kind of harmony yet variation in the same, in the same view that you, you view. So when it comes to, to classical architecture, I talked and, and they made a snippet of it in, in, in TikTok um, about the division of the logical division of the facade. You know, they had the baseline, midsection and upper section and you have the porch symmetries. It makes the building very, very readable. You can instantly when you walk around in your environment in your savannah, stone age brain, you know, walk around, you instantly can read the environment around you and that makes you calm. At the same time, it's not monotonous. So you have harmony and variation in the same facade. Mm -hmm. And that's how to say a, a one aspect of beauty that makes us like us very much. Mm. Of course, we like symmetries, but not perfect symmetries. The, the classical use porch symmetries. So windows are not placed, you know, in one long line. And if they are done, they try to, to make, you know, the, the fenestration, the fodder around the, the, the windows different but they group it in pairs all the time. Uh, so you don't have one symmetry, you have many symmetries. Mm. Very much like a face. You know, we, we have many symmetries in, in our face. So it's the same with the building. So that's, that I think is a very, very, very important aspect, readability. You can easily read your environment and that makes you feel safe. You know, always looking for, for safe. We don't like huge squares and going to the center of them because we feel unsafe. We want our backs a little covered. We want to quickly be able to get like a grip of the environment that we are in. At the same time, we don't want to get bored by the same environment. Mm. So it's connected to nature. And the classical has a lot of, you know, now when they're doing this, they do a lot of now neuroscience research and, and uh, fractal mathematic research. And what they noticed is that classical architecture has a lot of, you know, nature patterns, you know, with the fractal design. Mm. Um, so that, that's if you would reduce beauty to its biological component. Mm. Yeah. That is not a philosophical component, but like a biological component. Mm. Uh, it's not perfect, but, but I think th this is a, a very important argument. Readability, mm. safety, mm. and uh, positive stimulation of things that reminds of, of things that we are biologically inclined to look at. Mm. We're inclined to look at faces and study fa other people's faces and read these faces at the same time. Uh, when we mimic, you know, we, we show different kinds of mimics, you know, when we smile, we send signals to others and, and buildings do the same. So it, mm. that's, that's one aspect. Mm. The philosophical aspect I have I have hard, I've thought about it, but it's hard to define. It's something that you, I know, you feel it. Mm. And most people do feel it. And how do you know this? Well, look at, uh, I mentioned earlier when we met today, uh, I'm going to Ottawa uh, for, for, this, for this lecture. And I would say that Ottawa is a very modernistic city. Uh, I would, downtown Ottawa looks like entirely a modernism. Yet, if you look at the video of, of, the, of the tourist board of Ottawa, you hardly see any modernist building. You don't mm -hmm. see any. You see classical buildings and then you see inside of museums. How come? If you look at Visit Stockholm, you only see classical buildings. You don't see, you don't see 90% of Stockholm that is modernism. You see, they, they really know when, the, when they, they shoot the angles of the photos they take, they really stress to avoid any modernistic building you know, that is nearby. So, so apparently it is inside us. We know what is beautiful. And everyone that says otherwise, 
I would say is a liar or very indoctrinated. <laughs> one, uh, one, one thought that I've had is that the so many uh, modernist thinkers within modernist architecture, they put so much philosophy mm. into the modernistic architecture. Mm. Uh, it's supposed to uh, you can see how it's uh, signaling mm. political ideas, how it's mm. signaling um, uh, human uh, uh, value, and how mm. it's signaling. Uh, signaling. Uh, it's it's so much philosophical mm. signaling, mm. and uh, and that's maybe to put too much into architecture in a way yeah. that. Uh, I, um, I spoke to a classical architect once, uh, Christian Hoff Andersen, mm -hmm. who has mm -hmm. been on the show, and he said that maybe there's not, there's not uh, uh, meaningfulness in uh, beautiful uh, architecture mm -hmm. per se, but maybe beautiful architecture helps you live a meaningful life. Yes. So instead yeah. of putting all these, uh, in a way, very high terms into architecture mm. to say that it's the uh, the uh, yeah how they describe concrete, uh, it's, it speaks with volumes that are dramatic. It's yeah. just uh, yeah, the emperor's new clothes. It mm. really is that fable. It really is that fable because all the words they use, they try to know be better than the other one that brought this, you know, the, everyone competes in how much uh, nonsense they can spew on this mm -hmm. building and everyone's trying to be better that he or she understands this building much better than everyone else, mm -hmm. much like modernistic art, you know. Uh, you can put a banana on a wall and put tape on it now and all the cultural critics will go, uh, yeah, they will go bananas. <laughs> they, they will, you know, tell how this is a, they will see things that no one else see. Mm. Because they are not, you know, in their world, they are addressing each other. They don't care about the public or anyone else. They are position, positioning themselves in their internal hierarchy, who is the best critic. So then the one who can spew most words on this nonsense, wins and get mm. you know contract and, and uh, can become editor of a new cultural critic magazine or a section in a newspaper mm. but no one else see these strange things mm. and uh, yeah so very very good definition by it too, too much words you should just feel that it's beautiful and then of course if you know more about certain aspects of history then of course you can read you know ah oh, the, the ornaments used or the stylistic elements, they come from this period and that all is uh, Minerva from the Greek mythology. Mm. But if you don't know anything, you should just, you know, enjoy it, that it's beautiful. Mm. A setting for your life that can bring beauty to it. It's, uh, you can compare the view mm. to uh, Plato and Aristotle and mm. their view on uh, on poetry and mm. uh, on um, and Mimesis representation mm. that mm. Plato put so much into mm. it that mm. by mimicking nature that's further one mm. that's one further step from the idea world because mm. the world the physical world mm. is a shadow bad copy of the mm. ideal world and if mm. you make a copy of the copy it's even worse and it's mm. uh, and it's bad and therefore poetry is not good and blah 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 mm. and then Aristotle, his view on, uh, on representation mm. is, and poetry starts out with observation that mm. people enjoy uh, tragedy. Mm. And let's explore why they do it. They, explore mm. it. they enjoy to see a hero that they can uh, recognize and that mm. is good. Mm. And, and then he builds from that. And I think it, it, that can be compared to architecture. That in one way, someone can, the modernist puts uh, a lot of ideological and philosophical mm. reasoning behind every building. That, well, mm. that building, that classical building represents mm. Mm. either the bourgeoisie or mm. the bad with colonialism or mm. something. It, it makes it into a, this scary ghost and puts all mm. kind of values into it mm. instead of saying, well, what do we enjoy? As mm. you said, we enjoy mm. 
classical architecture and what mm. is the best classical architecture let us let us see how that mm. works mm. and um, 99 percent 99.99 percent of most people don't think about the political aspects of oh that building was built during the colonial era mm -hmm. they just enjoy it if it's beautiful yeah. they don't care and they even get proud of it so now in in, in many post-colonial countries you know i I uh, found a lovely new project in, in Hanoi in Vietnam. We built a completely new Art Deco hotel there with Vietnamese futures. Mm -hmm. So the decor decorations and internal are you know, from Vietnamese vernacular. So it's a very, very beautiful synchronism. But they got the Art Deco inspiration they got from France, of course, their former you know, uh, colonial overlords uh, that built a lot of, of beautiful buildings in, in Vietnam that they are very proud of now. Mm. So it's, they don't care, you know, that it was built during that time as little as we care, you know, okay, we don't have any, but let's say how many French people are not proud of their Roman heritage or British people, mm. you know, we are happier that they built the aqueducts, never mind that uh, they conquered Gaul in a very bloody fashion and suppressed the population. That's history and we are happy for their legacy. Mm. So it's not that you know injustice cannot be happened but but humans are not that you know ordinary people are not that political in their everyday lives mm. and they can recognize if something is good they want to keep it and the bad parts they will throw away yeah and it's also uh, and it's also many of these um, mm. ideologies that mm. are behind that kind mm. of uh, architecture is is very simple it's uh, it's very simple uh, thinking. Mm. Uh, for instance, we, we have this uh, uh, government building mm. in, um, in uh, Oslo where it's just a huge mm. brutalistic concrete block mm. and the ideology behind that is, mm. and there's a thousand small windows there, mm. and the ideology behind is that you're not supposed to see the office of the Prime Minister. Mm. Because he sits behind one of those mm. windows, and we're all equal. We're all the same, and that's yeah. that's uh, it's it's close to uh, how I would say not to be offensive to children, but that's how a child would argue mm. for e for equality. Mm. That let's build a building with equal windows, and mm. now we have an equal society. I'm, no. I'm not saying that's what they are thinking, but it's uh, it's. It's just so uh, banal. It's, it's 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 banal and no yeah. reason for building ugly. Yeah, uh, but banality is is uh, like a hallmark of everything modernist. Everything is so so banal in thinking, and and I, it's like they think like three years old. Uh, I I I once discussed with a with a Swedish architect firm representative for a Swedish architect firm that made this completely new area. They built a new city district in, in uh, a city called Linköping and it's just chaotic and I asked him oh, how, how could, did you come up with a plan to make every building like just a cacophony you know it, it's just crazy oh but we learned that people want variation yeah. uh, it's like <laughs> yeah but <laughs> the, the, the thinking is so banal all the time uh, they cannot you know it's that they cannot put themselves in the shoes of, of an ordinary person, uh, how we view our environment, and they cannot analyze the good environments. Because what I, I stressed in the last interview and always stress is, you know, reverse engineering. Okay, we like this city district. Why do we like it? How wide are the streets? How high are the buildings? How is the grid made? You know, just focus on what already works and check the city plans and you, and you have like a, a library of knowledge instead of doing this very very banal and shallow analysis people want variations so therefore we create the most uh, varied thing we can come up with and that's supposed to be good mm. so it's just one extreme to another in, in you know the mindset because there's no balance ever it's just childish banality all the time mm. This um, this false embrace mm. that we talked about mm. uh, earlier, how um, how people who are in opposition to mm. the classical movement try mm. to 
try to say that it's it's good that it's happening mm. like mm. Uh, low scale and, mm. and be happy uh, how do you think that should be met oh by continue with the same continue with the critique mm. uh, continue with the critique because every firm will do one project but they will not be consequential they will do you know they will okay let's say that they built this uh, they changed this uh, project in in nearby oslo central station to a more classical one but they at the same time they build 10 other projects that are totally ugly so cut them down you know all the time keep the flame on never stop the critique we have not won we have not won until all the universities all the architectural universities in norway in sweden and everywhere teach classical architecture program and, and classical city planning then we have won because then you know then you control the institutions and then all the magazines everything the whole discourse what is architecture of all time we change but now they're just using this tactic because they think it's a it's a phase you know ah it's a new trend now they like it in the classical and then in 10 years time we'll just you know continue business as usual mm. uh, and they are not honest and they will always make how to say hybrid projects so they will make something classical and then they will ruin it by putting some crazy modernist future in it like sneak it in you know mm. that we don't notice so so no i i don't believe in reforming any modernist i'm i'm serious about that just remove them they can do other things in <laughs> life and then educate people that have genuine interest for classical architecture mm. they they should solve it it's not that I'm against that these modernists do classical projects, but it's not, you know, it doesn't come from the heart. Mm. It's just to deflect criticism uh, while one wait for, how to say, better, for them, better wins to come. Yeah, I'm, mm. um, I, I think it's, um, uh, as, as in, in any movement, mm. I think when it's, it's such a crucial mm. state when mm. some uh, something has uh, or the movement has started mm. in the way mm. and and it can have a very good beginning and then mm. it can just uh, just die out yeah. in a way or just become become something else than a movement it, it mm. can end up not changing anything mm. to the better mm. uh, actually even to the worse yes uh, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm personally thinking very much about how uh, what what are the most most important aspects of this period um, mm. and um, um, and personally personally i think it's uh, raising the raising the knowledge about mm. about classical architecture mm. and um, um, and of course the mm. institutions mm. Uh, but that's uh, that's a difficult difficult task mm. ah, it's it's possible you know they yeah. went modernist one time so they yes. <laughs> become classical again yeah. uh, uh, th th three or four things i would say are very very important now one is while you know there's a lot of media attention there's always there are always people that want to become a classical architect and they now they should know that you can become one and connect with them so that we educate in more classical architects because the more classical architects we, we educate the more classical architecture there will be it's just you know every architect wants to build mm. so the more we educate the more there will be and then there can be a, a critical mass of new classical architects so education and finding the talent that there is in every society and educate it so they don't go away to i don't know uh, computer game design you know mm. because now there is a self-selection at architecture schools everyone knows what contemporary architecture is so you don't go to architecture school if you don't like to create you know strange boxes uh, so we need to break that self-selection by finding those that had an idea that i could become a classical architect find them and make them grow protect them make them grow give them the right education tools everything so that they can become a classical architect that is one thing keeping the movement afloat is a hard task because these are very very loose movements it's a very good thing because as soon as something gets too organized and people get you know paid for what they are doing 
everything falls apart because there's the passion is totally lost. The thing with the architecture uprising is that we want it we want it to be unnecessary. The goal of the architecture uprising is to cancel itself. Mm. We don't want it to exist, you know. Uh, but we, it has to exist until there is a genuine top, bottom, bottom, top change, a change of, of architecture in, in an entire society. Uh, but that, of course, means that there are people that work with this voluntarily. And it takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, and no one gets paid for it. And you have, you know, your regular life and regular day job. So it is a hard combination. So it's, it's vulnerable in a sense. Mm -hmm. So keep the good recruitment of, of people that have time and take time for this project. Like a continuation uh, of people because it is tiresome to work with this for many years. Because I said, you don't get paid for it. Mm. Uh, I think it's dead fun and all people in our sexual pricing think also it's dead fun. Mm. But I think that people around us maybe not think it's dead fun that we are so engaged in a subject, you know, <laughs> taking so many hours, you know, of our spare time yeah. uh, for, for this. Uh, so, yeah, that is the continuation and keep the flame alive all the time because it is a, a oil tanker needs to be you know on the main topic year after year after year after year after year there must never never be a pause because the current establishment don't want this to exist they want to continue with their modernism they have no interest of changing they have no interest in of listening to the public they don't want this debate the only reason why they have this debate is that they were forced gunpoint hmm. otherwise they have always succeeded before to suppress it now they can't but they want to. Yeah, and it's also mm. and it's also um, <clears throat> so as with as with uh, so many changes, larger uh, changes in society, there are always strong forces mm. behind that it is supposed to change, and not mm. only among architects, but also mm. among, uh, for instance, that large industry that has mm. grown. Uh, in uh, the large green industry yeah. that has grown, mm. that uh, has uh, certain labels that you can mm. put on buildings that mm. they are now green and mm. can be called green if mm. they um, if they can, yeah, some some kind of um, if they follow some kind of rules that um, yeah. yeah 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 there are of course many interests and and those interests will try to keep the status quo and they. They have, they have their interest to sell their products. So yes, you have to, uh, to analyze that. And green architecture, yes, we touched that last year. It's one of the biggest scams, I would say. And it's so irritating uh, to see them talk about green architecture because they don't understand what green architecture is. So I'm going to repeat myself from self here. The greenest building is one that people want to preserve. And why do you want to preserve a building? Because it was built in eco-friendly materials. Is that a reason? Oh, it was good material. So that's why we should uh, retrofit this building. Uh, no, that, that's not the reason. Why do we retrofit old factory buildings from the 19th century or warehouses and make them luxury living? Where I live in Stockholm, we like old uh, uh, mills. They made luxury, uh, luxury hotel off. Why, why was it repurposed? Because it had value beyond mere function. It was beautiful and it was rich in cultural expression. That's why it's retrofitted. And in that sense, it's a green building because it has a long lifespan. No building will uh, retain its original function forever. If you build a school today, maybe in a hundred years, there are no kids in the area, so the school will close. Will you tear down the building or will you find a new purpose for it? If you build a beautiful building that also has, you know, expression, which is an expression of, you know, values that we had in that time, people will see it both. They will go to length. Ah, oh, we will must keep this building. So we just adapt it a little bit and then it's housing. And in a hundred years time, it's not housing anymore. It will be an office. A hundred years from that, it will not be an office anymore. It can become a school again. So that, that's a green building, a building that we want to mm. preserve. If you build ugly buildings in eco-friendly materials, when the original function is not valid, when it's not a school anymore, when it's not an office anymore, then things will be torn down. Mm. It, it's simple as that, because no one will protest. Because if developers have always been interested you know, in 
tearing down and building you. It's their business and I don't, I don't you know, criticize them for it, but that's their main interest. Uh, so what we're doing now in, in Stockholm, we tear down offices from the I-80s, from the 1990s, and soon we will tear down offices from the 2000s. Is that green? Oh, the, oh, we tore it down and built a new green office. Mm. Yeah, but that new green office is as ugly as the old one. So in 30 years time, you'll tear that down with the excuse that you have a green, we will build a greener office. So that, that's the whole fallacy with green architecture. It doesn't understand why we preserve buildings. And a building that is already built, you know, it's stored greenhouse gases. It has made, you know, the biggest contribution to uh, to CO2 is, you know, the whole construction of the building, of the process that it requires. Mm. So the longer the lifespan, the, the more eco-friendly eco -friendly a building is. And if you want long lifespan, beautiful and rich in cultural expression. Mm. No, no, no other options, really. Do you, uh, you who are so much in the in the field, mm. uh, uh, do you do you know if there are done much research on that when it comes to classical architecture? Because I'm I'm thinking that is something I, as you know, uh, of course I I'm I totally agree, mm. and but to think strategically how how that can be argued instead of saying mm. that when when. Uh, builders say that well we have this mm. the, it's the most uh, green building mm. ever built in mm. uh, Stockholm and we're going to construct it and it's mm. uh, a victory for the green movement mm. and then and why do the green movement buy it this is so irritating why yeah. do they buy all this nonsense all the time so <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it, it would have been mm. so great for the classical movement to have a think tank uh, tank mm. or something similar to that with a more strategic mm. not that much uh, uh, not so much a movement not so mm. much uh, um, um, uh, ideological or mm. idealistic view mm. but a strategic view that would actually mm. say okay we need to uh, show proof for this mm. in a language that bureaucrats understand mm. and in a language that uh, politicians and builders understand to say mm. that this is also getting a, some mm. kind of green approval or mm. something like that or mm. to uh, change the ways that they mm. are approved so that concrete and glass are not uh, are regarded as uh, mm. not green at all because mm. they are not. Mm. Um, do you know if there's any development in that direction or uh, research? I am optimistic that there will be because I think the last 15 years have been an, like a an flood of surveys now of people's preferences when it comes to aesthetics. So there, there has been, there was one in, in a Norwegian paper, I think in, in, uh, in a, a newspaper from Oslo, uh, if it was Aften Posten, yeah. that made a survey, you know, what, what Osloites prefer for new architecture. 33% wanted to see more new classical architecture and only 3% wanted new modernists. Of course, the modernists will say that they don't understand, they don't want something else, they want quality. But you get this kind of students more and more and more often in many, many different countries. So it's just a, it's just a matter of time it, it will come. Uh, first, you have to just establish the argument. Because I think that most people, when they hear it, it sounds intuitive, very logical. Mm. It sounds very logical. Yeah, why, why do... Why do I keep this? Why did I keep this jacket for 20 years and threw away that jacket after two years? Oh, it was because the materials was very robust. No, because you loved that jacket. And why did you love the jacket? Because it looked good on you. So, so it's people can, you know, think process. They will find this very logical argument, and then in the end, they, they will be tested. Mm -hmm. And it can be tested. Or you can do scientific research, or you can just make some research of your own. Look at an old building in, in Oslo or Stockholm that was built in 1820. How many different functions have it had? If you check the archives, oh, it was a butcher store, then it became an apartment store, and then it became a, a bar, you know, in the bottom floor, and then it became this, and then in the 60s it made, was made, the entire building was made an office, and now they're making... So it changes all the time. And then you have this, you know, 
because in, in uh, except for green there are a lot of other buzzwords you know resilience is one of those trendy words yeah. and this is resilience that things just change naturally over time mm. it's like every generation can just adapt a little bit and reuse the entire structure mm. so it's logical and intuitive so most people will not need a scientific research to be convinced but yeah it will come it will come in the end as as said, as, as many uh, surveys that are done now showing uh, you know, people's preferences, and it's very amusing. I post them, I throw them in the face to the modernist all the time, and it's so amusing because they, they try to discredit the research because they don't like the results. But there is clearly, there has never been any, any study that shows that people prefer modernism to classical architecture. All studies that have ever been made show the same thing and it's a large preferences to traditional architecture uh, towards modernism mm. uh, so uh, yeah it it will it will come i wasn't optimistic five years ago but today i'm very optimistic i just sit back and enjoy you know, all the <laughs> studies that come yeah. um, so, sorry for just continuing this because now i it came to mind because it comes so many different interesting research so we had one study now from, I think it was 2020, uh, where researchers at Lunds University, and they have no connection to architectural uprising, they have no you know, political leanings, they made a study, what type of cityscapes do city managers think are good for the city? So you have like city managers, city directors, it's like uh, every municipality in like some branding, now, you know, you want people to come to downtown for events and different things. So this, they ask them, uh, look at these six types of different buildings, and you have different classical buildings and different modernist buildings. Which do you think will attract visitors to your city? And the result was, as you can guess, you know, the city managers believe that classical architecture is what brings people to the city centers, and modernist architecture does not have the same effect. So tons of, of different kind of research and in different aspects that come now and they all show the same thing so mm. so we will see it very soon you will have have how green you know classical buildings are because they are beloved lifespan mm. and that that um, that makes me think of the 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 green movement how that mm. they uh, that movement has a lot of uh, a lot of uh, fights that they mm. take but one of them which is I think connected to architecture too mm. is uh, that they have not taken is how the society uh, is so um, uh, how do you say that that you you use it for a short period of time mm. and then throw it away mm. And that is al almost like how architecture is, yes. is regarded. Mm. And that has not, to a very large degree, been a topic for the mm. Green Movement. Like mm. they have, there's no demonstrations outside, mm. uh, uh, outside IKEA oh. that sells bad quality uh, uh, furnitures mm. um, that are supposed to, that underbuilds this notion that you're not supposed to have a furniture for life for life you're mm. supposed to have it until you get tired of it and mm. uh, or it breaks down because mm. it doesn't last mm. because it's bad quality mm. so it's it's kind of in in society in in total mm. this uh, disregard for uh, quality that lasts and mm. that can be reused mm. in another way but still appreciated mm. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a general problem of the green movement. I'm very supportive of, of green movement, but the most vocal in, in the green movement are always those that are very emotional and not very intelligent. So they are very emotional. So you get this, uh, the end is near. You know, I believe in climate change, but it was the green movement that, you know, made many countries, Sweden included, cut down our nuclear energy. And now, they have woken up. Oh, we need new uh, nuclear energy. Even Greta <laughs> wants new nuclear energy now. The same people that you know made huge demands to close all this are now the ones who want to open. So they can change, uh, and they are good allies, and what they do are important. 
but they are very easily duped by, by different interest groups. Uh, I think, I don't want to, you know, sell conspiracy theories, but I think uh, Russia was very supportive of, of the Green Movement in Germany for this reason that they were against nuclear energy and thus Germany got more dependent on, on Russian gas. So they are very much duped uh, and they are ready to, to pay for things that are, shouldn't, they shouldn't pay that much for. If you think of it now, it's very popular with, with uh, oats milk. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't oats milk be cheaper than cow milk? Because, you, you know, cow milk is, you know, the cow has to, you need to feed the cow and the cow will produce milk and then you package it. You remove one step, yet oats milk is double the expensive than regular milk and people are fine with it. So, so uh, this movement is always duped by, by different interest groups. So how to consensus with it? Yeah, they should be our ally. But I think they are, are suspicious of us because they are very much focused on, on technology and technological vision that somehow technology is will solve all our, our problems when we can solve our problems by, you know, not everything, but a lot of things we can by just learning how you did things before. Mm. Like, like many subjects, you know, th compared to, to food, uh, we ate organic a hundred years ago. And then everyone threw themselves over white bread, uh, uh, refined sugar and uh, cans. And everyone was so happy that uh, now you can have instant meal that you put in microwave. You don't need to cook. Mm. And then we realized, oh, this is crap. So we started back and everyone tries to be a chef now and make their own dog and bake uh, their hot dogs and, <laughs> and make their own, uh, bake their own bread. Yeah. Same with cars. Everyone biked to work a hundred years ago or took the tram. Then everyone was happy they did to car and now there's nothing more trendy and more show that you care that you bike to work or that you that you take uh, tram. So we can learn, you know, a lot from that, a lot, lot of techniques and, and, and uh, yeah, uh, everything from city planning to architecture that can have a positive effect on on everything from climate to, to ecology. Mm. I'm. Mm. I'm, I'm thinking we, we have discussed uh, very much the, the ideology mm -hmm. behind, behind the architecture. And I think that's the most important mm -hmm. thing to, to discuss mm -hmm. uh, because that's where the core is. Yeah. And, and then, but then all, uh, all often comes the argument about, um, about costs. Yeah. And although I think the ideology is the most important because mm -hmm. then the uh then the cost perspective will follow yes uh, because if it is ideologically correct in mm. a way mm. to make classical then it mm. will become cheaper to mm. build classical mm. uh, because then that will be the standards that you buy and yeah. and that will be the standards that people can build and that will follow mm. but but still um, spanish developers would you know get crazy if they knew what building standards that Norwegian and Swedish developer has to put up with, you know, with insulation and, uh, and everything. Mm. But shall we have lower standards? Uh, oh, sorry, just a sidetrack, but, but it's, mm. it's like we get what we demand. And I know that the market will get profitable. It's not that they have a problem of earning money. So they will find a ways to rationalize and effective, uh, make things effective. Mm. So the cost argument is, is totally invalid. It is, it is ideology, as you mentioned. Mm. Mm. But do you have any thoughts on how to, <clears throat> how to meet that argument now, in the current state, with, mm. the, with the cost arguments? I, I think, as mentioned, that it will, it will follow and develop, mm. but uh, right now... Yes, I, can, I have, I have yeah. a very, 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 very easy one. Because the classical is not the ornaments. Uh, people that hang up themselves on cost think that, oh, now every facade must be richly decorated with granite and gold and there must be marble everywhere. No, the classical is, you can make a box that is classical. It's how you divide the facade. Mm. And you can have very stripped classicism and it will still be beautiful. Uh, 
So you don't need expensive, uh, lavish materials. You don't need ornament. You can have a very naked building and it's still beautiful. And if one wants to see an example of, of, of this, you have the uh, Mietekasen tenement barracks, you know, built in Berlin, built in Stockholm. You have probably have them in, in Oslo. They were considered hor hor uh, horrific, you know. Today they are inhabited by, you know, wealthy upper middle class. Mm -hmm. But in those days they were considered horrific ugly just because they had no ornament. Basically, they followed just the classical rule, you know, the facade division, but they were no ornament at all. No ornament at all. Just, just you know, uh, plaster on the facade, but otherwise, and, and stone in the ground level, but otherwise no ornament. Because, because the facade division, you know, the the baseline, the part symmetries, and the logical part at the upper section, you know, the windows get smaller and you see that it's a clear like a roof section, they're still considered beautiful. So you don't need the materials and it's not more expensive to make a classical facade division. It is not. Because when you build today, everything is, you know, prefabricated. There will not be, uh, ideally in the future, but today there will not be, you know, wielders and it will not, it will not be uh, how to say brick like internally it will be basically a concrete skeleton and then you put plaster on it mm. so it will not be it's not a single dime more expensive but then of course if you have uh, projects that have higher budget and higher ambition if you build a new luxury building then you can add you know ornament then you can add the paintings different cultural expressions but just building regular cheap buildings and they don't need to be cheap because the profits that the housing companies in Norway and Sweden do is, is you know, it's quite high. Mm. Uh, so they, they have money, they, you know, they, they, could, they could spend 10, 15% more on every building and still earn huge profits on them. Um, so, yeah, divide the facade classical is not more expensive than doing it modernist. Everything will still be prefabricated, there will be concrete modules under and then you put plaster on the facade to hide it. We don't care what's the internal structure of the building. No one cares. It's the facade that matters and you know of course how the apartments work and how the whole physical structure if it's a courtyard building or if it's a freestanding building. Mm. So that's the main main argument. Mm. It's not about ornament. It's facade division. Yeah. Mm. I um I just think it's a um, uh mm. It's a great thought experiment to think what is the ideal situation mm. of, uh, of uh, this movement or of what we are hoping mm. for. Mm. And uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I can, mm. I can share some of mine mm. uh, that I, <clears throat> I think that it would be an ideal situation if, as we, I, I remember mm. fondly that we talked about last time how older ruins could mm. be rebuilt yeah that the parthenon mm. is being rebuilt that mm. uh, old church ruins mm. are being rebuilt if they mm. are worth rebuilding yeah. of course mm. and that that's a way of living in uh, harmony with history yes and we are part of it we yes. are not like separate spectators we are the same humans as they were 2000 years ago yeah Mm. And and also that uh, that uh, the classic uh, that the classical architecture mm. is the norm, and mm. that it's also being developed. That it's mm. being developed uh, also uh, intellectually when it's mm. discussed, and of course among uh, architects and uh, city planners, and mm. that we can see exciting development and mm. variation that yeah. you wouldn't have had the chance. To do earlier because mm. there although i don't buy into the uh, modernistic view that it's uh, uh, progress that just goes uh, mm. s straight forward but there are some things that we can do now that we couldn't mm. do 200 years yeah. ago due to machines and due to uh, technology and imagine how many possibilities there yeah. are to make just fantastic buildings mm. and we just go the opposite direction yeah there, there are so so many ways and, and there has never ever been more talent in the world think of it we are, we are eight billion people now and of these eight billion a majority will get schooling and a majority will have access to go to educate themselves on the universe 
But all these 8 billion are more wasted than the 1 billion that lived 100 years ago. There were only 1 billion people, and of those, how many of those went to school and to architecture school? Still, they produced much, more, be, much better art and much better architecture than these 8 billion uh, do today, despite that these 8 billion have not eight that many time people that have access, uh, how to say, a, a genu potential geniuses that have access to education, probably 80 times or 100 times more, uh, but we just waste them because they are, they're, how to say, their talent is directed to shitty architecture schools and, and equally bad uh, painting schools. How, how many, you know, how, how many pa talented painters are there? Classical painters that are alive today that are recognized? Uh, quite few, I would say. Despite that there has never been, you know, more, ta more people that have access to this kind of education and that can realize their dreams if they want to. So, ideally, if we could steer all this talent to the right direction, and then, of course, there will be an explosion. If you have 80 times as many geniuses as 100 years ago, or 800 times as many geniuses, think of all the beautiful things that they could create, and all the things they could come up with, uh, and all the exciting syncretism. I, I mentioned this when, when we spoke before this interview, but before the post-war, uh, before the, the war, there was very, very interesting, you know, culture exchanges and, and syncretisms that happened. You had, you know, Chinese art deco. It's art deco, you recognize it's art deco, but the motifs and the ornaments and decorations are from Chinese vernacular and Chinese history and mythology. Equally, you have Vietnamese art deco and Indian art deco, and then you have art deco that is Mayan revival, uh, mostly in southern United States, where they were inspired by the motifs of, of uh, uh, the Mesoamerican cultures. And then uh, in Israel you have very few buildings, unfortunately, not that many. They are needed there because it not, generally is a very modernistic country of Hebrew national revival. It's their national romanticism. But they recognized during the early 1900s, oh, we need also need this. So they created in their own national revival. So there was like an experimentation and, and syncretism and all kinds of, of people, you know, picked things from other peoples and fused it with their own and created, you know, amazing work of art. And it would be so lovely to continue with that instead of reducing every place to Starbucks anywhere architecture and everyone is reduced to become a consumer. And that's the way the, the world is heading now and it's, it's very, very tragical. It's not that I... I like to consume as much as everyone else, but there should be like a force against this, against this homogenization, and architecture is one of those forces. Mm. And, and I also liked what you said uh, uh, in the, uh, earlier in the talk mm -hmm. that it, it should include everything. Yeah. That, that's how a mindset is, is changed mm. when, when it's also gas stations and yeah. Starbucks and, and mm. everything. Uh, and street lights and, and uh, you know, you, you travel on, on the highway, you see the, I don't know what you call it in English, but you know, they have the uh, things that block you from, you know, driving, yeah. uh, driving out. Why shouldn't those be cast iron and beautiful? Mm. They were before. And look at the bridges, how beautiful old bridges are and how ugly bridges are today. They're just pure functional and you have like concrete uh, ramps. Why? Everything should be beautiful. It's like a holistic view, not just architecture. Even the pavement should be beautiful. What a difference it makes when you have, uh, when I say cobblestones, I don't want you know people to have a hard time walking on them. You can make a modern one that's very flat, but you see that it's like a, a pattern, a structure made of cobblestone. How beautiful, how, how it lifts the whole street compared with the usual asphalt. Mm. So everything can be made beautiful and everything affects us in a, in a positive way. And that's the way we should strive to live for, to make it as beautiful as possible. Beauty affects us in so many positive ways, and it inspires new geniuses. Who gets inspired by ugliness? I don't know any. Why, why if, if you have, and, and because we always need scientific proof for this, uh, we have 
artist apartments in Stockholm. It's the city owns certain apartments that are, you know, they are uh, only artists can live in them and have their studios. Where are they situated? Are they situated in our suburbs? No, not a single one. They are all in cozy 18th century houses uh, on the southern section of uh, Old Stockholm downtown. Mm. Why do artists need this? Why, why can't they create anything in, you know, in a concrete high rise from the 60s? Why, why do they need these environments to create beauty? Why do they need to be surrounded by this? It's like you need proof for everything that everyone does already. Mm. So everything that's obvious for everyone, they know what works, yet if you would ask them, they have been trained to say that they don't know what works, yet everyone knows what works. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's really everything is so upside down all the time. As, as mentioned earlier, as, as with the tourist boards, oh, beauty is relative, yet every tourist board will only market the classical, classical buildings in their respective city. Mm. Uh, maybe not 100%, but at least 80-90% of everything that you will see from, it doesn't matter, I mentioned Ottawa, that is a mostly modern city, no matter what city that you will visit and you will check that, that tourist information of that city, they will show you classical buildings. Yet beauty is relative. Mm. <laughs> so, so it's, it's, uh, it's mind-boggling, it's, it's really, this, 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 yeah, it's, what, what can I say? Why do we need scientific proof for something that everyone already knows? You know, gut feeling. Mm. Mm. But uh, then, yeah, it's... Uh, because it, it's like, an, it's endless. You need scientific research for everything. Because if you, if you have the, this relativistic mindset, everything has to be scientifically proven. Mm. What everyone knows is true and right. Of course, there is a value to question things. It's not that we should, you know, blindly follow. But if people, you know, feel that, oh, I like this and I don't like this, and I know that for certain that tourists want to see this and not this, well, maybe we should be more of that then and less of that, because if you don't want to show tourists that, why do you want to see that yourself? You live in the city every day. They just come for a short visit. Well, you, this is your environment where you live in every day. Why should it be ugly? Why not have more of, of what we like and less of what we don't like? This is just pu very pure and simple logic. It's, it, it's, it's, you don't need, you know, this advanced research or anything. It's very, very intuitive, mm. I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, 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 definitely. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's intuitive, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also, um, it's also difficult to to navigate in mm. in the society where everything has to have this kind of stamp yeah. or have to have this kind of uh, mm. scientific um, research behind it yeah. that shows that it fulfills some kind of regulation or some mm. kind of um, some kind of um, and this scientism uh, what you call it in English scientism where like everything science is the new god mm. it reduces us to algorithm and this is one fear I have with all this neuroscience research on one hand you know a hundred years ago there was an objective truth god but you can't use god as an argument now so so the objective truth is the new objective truth now is neuroscience but then you will reduce us to how to say that the whole perception that will penetrate our minds is that we are just a bunch of, you know, genetic algorithms more or less. Mm -hmm. And it's not an a inspiring worldview or self-image. And it will not create, it, will, it can create bad architecture. Bad, not in a way that it will be ugly, but it will be neuroscience architecture. It will be architecture like a drug, you know, that will <laughs> give us pleasure but without any meaning. Mm. And this is something I'm very afraid of in general when it comes to new traditional architecture. I try to critique mm. all the time that it's just not just we use the form, but we don't try. We talked about depth, of course, but I want there to be some depth yeah. in the building, some signaling, some ornament, some expression. As I said, if you know nothing, you should just be able to enjoy it. But if you have a hint of a knowledge, then you should be able to read a bit of the building. You know, it should express something about, yes, about our time, our connection with the past, but also what we like to see in the future. Uh, 
if you take the, the latest sort of classical style Art Deco, it had a lot of interesting uh, ornament. It combined of, two of course, you know, classical motifs, but as mentioned, you had Mayan revival. Um, what did they want to express with that? I think it was more like there was some kind of depth to it. Uh, a lot of Art Deco buildings have things that were seen as revolutionary at the time. Uh, the combustion engines. So you see airplanes and cars, all these things that were going to salvage humanity from, from the poverty that existed at that time. They had very high hopes that you know, the arrival of the combustion engine will revolutionize everything. And it did, of mm. course. You know, uh, suddenly transport, everything you know, was revolutionized. Uh, what do we have in our time that we could you know, decorate our buildings with that gives us hope for the future? And I want it to be hope, not doom and gloom. No. <laughs> climate change is going to kill us all or something. Yeah. And cell phone is a curse. It's a blessing and a curse at the same time. So something, you know, decorate our buildings with something that we thought of at this time. Mm. Th that would be beautiful. And not just algorithm architecture that we get high on the buildings because it's perfectly crafted for, for our brains, according to neuroscience. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and it's... Um, it's uh, very interesting point what mm -hmm. you said say mm -hmm. about uh, the fear of becoming an algorithm mm -hmm. because that is uh, the the wish must mm -hmm. be to have a change in mindset mm -hmm. but not just a change but a change that would last mm -hmm. and i think if it becomes this algorithm development it's it might change but it's way easier to fall back yeah. because I, I think that was one of the main, uh, main mistakes mm. of, the, um, of the late mm. uh, or of the end of classical mm. uh, architecture was that it became too algorith uh, yeah. algorithmic mm. um, and it became like a recipe how to mm. build uh, and how to paint and mm. it was supposed to follow this uh, school and it... Yeah. A and it became, um, how is it, dog dogmatic too, in a way, and, yeah. and too, too, too square, not live, it, redu reduc how is it, reductionist, reducing the human, human mind. Yes, to, mm. they didn't use, I, didn't, I don't know if the word algorithm existed back then, but yeah, reducing us from, from spiritual beings to just predictable machines. Mm. So mm. although those buildings uh, are a hundred times better than mm. modernist buildings, mm. they are still not, uh, they, they had some kind of uh, boredom to them yeah. in a way. Mm. They became too, too, too rigid. Too, too rig rigid. Yeah. yeah. And the, the reaction um, was Art Nouveau. Yeah. That was the first reaction, at least, mm. because they were tired of neo-Renaissance, neo-classicism, neo-everything, you know. So they wanted to create a new art form that was still classical, mm. but, you know, broke the rules in a good way, uh, in a talented way, mm. and created something that was more organic and was also a reaction to all this industrialization that was happening, you know, because the standardization, uh, they were very fearful of, of craft losing... To, to, you know, mass-produced, ornaments, mass-produced, everything, maybe rightfully so. E everything is relative, you know. Back in then, there were still, you know, hundreds and thousands of, of craftsmen. Uh, but yeah, we, we need that kind of reaction as well. We want, how to say, you should have the framework, but from the framework, you should be able to create. And if you are talented, that's the thing is, Talented people should break the rules. We don't want every, every architect to see himself as an artist. There is, it's not bad to be a, an average architect and create an average good building. A majority of classical buildings were made by average classical architects. But because the education was good and they got a good framework, the average is so high, you know, what they create. And then you have a few very, very talented ones and they create, you know, the more spectacular buildings, the parliament building or the uh, new post office, etc., etc. Mm. Uh, because th this is a thing with modernists now. Uh, I spoke about, you know, uh, narcissism. Everyone wants to be seen. Everyone wants to be recognized as a creative genius. So how, do, how can you become a creative genius according to modernism? Well, you're not allowed to look back. Uh, 
and you are not allowed to have anything that looks similar to something that has already been done because new is the most important one. Okay, let's use computer and make the computer calculate the strangest shape that we can have and then make the computer place the windows as randomly as possible on, on the facade. So let talented people do the development and there is no there's no lack of honor of being a good average architect, but every architect should not be aspire to be a star architect. He can have a love for, for architecture and love for buildings, but he should focus on serving his community more or you know the, the places where he build and not thinking of marketing himself and his name and sticking out. It's like a, like a comp opposite view, like humbleness. Mm. And it's very much needed in, in our built environment, more humbleness. Yeah. Beauty but humbleness, you know. When you walk down a classical street, you don't notice that many buildings. You enjoy them, and if you look up, you know, oh, it's beautiful, but you pass by them in, in a matter of seconds. Mm. They are just there in the background and make the everything beautiful, but it's more unconscious. The goal should mm. be when you enter mm. a new area, Mm. a new built area that yeah. you're not supposed to see that it's new no or at least mm. it will take some time that maybe oh is this newly painted oh it's a new building yeah, yeah. okay In, instead of thinking of it as architecture it will yeah. just be a it will just be a beautiful backdrop yeah we, we do we shouldn't you know be bomb we are so bombarded anyway so it should be beautiful and harmonic but if we don't want to it should not be in our faces. If you have time, you stand still, you can just look at the building and you know, grasp how beautiful it is, all the different details. But otherwise, it's just a beautiful harmonic setting that you can pass by and consume like unconsciousness. It doesn't need to have strange shape, uh, everything like aggressive that really screams for attention. No, that should be like completely eradicated from the built environment because it's, it's psychologically wrong. It's like forcing people to see something provocative. Mm. Why, why is it so important to force people to see something provocative in their built environment? Uh, wh what is to gain? Oh, I saw that ugly building. Uh, did that person that saw it, did he become happier? Did he become a better person? Wh what, is, you know, what, what's, what will be the positive outcome of being exposed to this? I can't think of any, if they have any argument, you know, I will be glad to listen, but I don't think they have an argument in any way. I think they just, everything is about seen, 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 and they don't care if people see it, they want it to be spoken about because it's internally. Uh, they are positioning themselves internally among other architects. And the more you are disliked and make controversy, the higher in the internal architect hierarchy you become. Mm. And invited to more dinner parties in your friend's classical apartments because this is a this is a fun thing uh, sorry i'm straying now but but uh, a majority of swedish architects live in classical buildings and almost all of them also work in classical buildings and yeah. this is not this is not i invented this statistic this is what this swedish you know the the magazine for the profession architekten is called name of the survey where do architects live and it's strange that like 60% of architects live in buildings built before 1920. And if you check out the total built environment in Sweden, how many buildings are built from you know, 1920 and beyond, it's like 10% of the total housing stock. That's 60% of architects live there. And where do they have their offices? Usually it's also you know, in, in downtown in a beautiful classical buildings. And it never occurred to them, okay, you want to live like this and you want to work like this. Why don't you want anyone else to have this? Why, if, if you recognize that these buildings have certain qualities that you like, why don't create similar buildings? It, it's, yeah, there are so many logical fallacies, you know, it's a, are they blind and deaf? Do they never ever do like self, how to say, self uh, inspection? Oh, I, I, I draw modernism, but I want to live in a classical building in a classical neighborhood and then I want to work and also in a classical environment. Oh, but modernism is the only way. Hmm. It, it is strange. Yeah.
It's um, um, similar to the architecture uh, yeah. school in, or not school, but architecture house in uh, in Oslo. It's also yeah. in a beautiful classical classical building. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, that's when I when I think mm-hmm. of it, that's yeah. more uh, schizophrenic in a way mm-hmm. than uh, than um, uh, modernistic painters, mm-hmm. because they usually ne- don't necessarily have. Uh, uh, only classical paintings on the wall but no. they can have some they have mm. usually a mix or yeah but it's uh, it's that's the thing with architecture that it's mm. so it's so visible and so um, it's so easy to look through this kind of uh, this kind of uh, hypocrisy yeah and why don't they reflect over it why? why? I, I really can't understand it. If, I don't know if they've made a similar survey in Norway, but it wouldn't surprise me if the situation is exactly the same here, and exactly the same in the UK, and exactly the same in Germany, exactly the same in Italy. I can't answer for North America, but in Europe I think it will be like similar results all the time. And that these people don't reflect, why do I like this building? Don't other people like this building? Why do I create buildings that I myself don't want to live in or work in. It, it's really, you know, it's it, yeah. it really, you know, uh, cognitive dissonance, you know, must be like enormous or something uh, that you never reflect over this. Uh, but we'll see. The more we point this out, hopefully, you know, things will change. I know at least one magazine that pointed this out, the, the Spiegel, uh, and... Uh, it should be pointed out that this is not a right-wing magazine, it's a very left-wing magazine. Uh, they had an interview with Rem Kohlhaas. And they asked him, you know, specifically, uh, there is a saying that if architects had to live in where, what they draw, our cities would be more beautiful. And he, of course, argued against, no, no, that's total nonsense, you know, it has nothing to do with it. So I asked him, okay, where, where do you live? Oh, it doesn't matter where I live. Uh, where do you live? Oh, I live in a Victorian mansion. <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> <laughs> so it's so like, okay, always the same, always the same every time. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry for straying, but, but it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's amusing. And I, I think I said it in many interviews that they are not very intelligent people. And I stand with that. And I think one reason is self-selection, of course, to the profession and to stay sane in that profession you have to have cognitive dissonance you have to have you know believe in ugliness and believe that you are doing some kind of good when it's you yourself don't want to live in it and you never never do self-criticism or self-reflection and also you lack common classical education because when i meet classical architects they usually have quite broad knowledge you know, of, of many subjects. They are interested in the world. You know, they, they have read a book, they have learned literature, they are interested in the world they live in. When I speak to modernist architects, it's like the world was invented yesterday. They seem to lack all kind of deep knowledge. Of course, this is not everyone. Maybe this is just anecdotal, but, but still, I never met a modernist that I was impressed by his or hers, how to say, common knowledge outside the field of architecture. That has never, never happened to me. And this, I think, also is a, one reason why modernists get so ugly and why they also, why they are able to get away in their own profession with all these new speak and new words because they generally don't know any history. They don't know anything about the past because the past was bad. They were, uh, had a lot of prejudice in the past, so we cannot learn anything from them. So.